The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 21st chapter. And just as you read along, know that I am reading from the message version of the Bible, which is a more contemporary translation, so don't be surprised that it doesn't match what is in your bulletin. Luke writes, One day, people were standing around talking about the temple, remarking how beautiful it was, the splendor of its stonework and memorial gift. Jesus said, All this you're admiring so much? The time is coming when every stone in that building will end up in a heap of rubble. They asked him, Teacher, when is this going to happen? What clue will we get that it's about to take place? He said, Watch out for the doomsday deceivers. Many leaders are going to show up with forged identities claiming, I'm the one, or the end is near. Don't fall for any of that. When you hear of wars and uprisings, keep your head and don't panic. This is routine history and no sign of the end. <clears throat> he went on. Nation will fight nation and ruler fight ruler over and over. Huge earthquakes will occur in various places. There will be famines. You'll think at times that the very sky is falling. But before any of this happens, they'll arrest you, hunt you down, and drag you to court and jail. It will go from bad to worse, dog eat dog, everyone at your throat because you carry my name. You'll end up on the witness stand, called to testify. Make up your mind right now not to worry about it. I'll give you the words and wisdom that will reduce all your accusers to stammers and stutters. You'll even be turned in by parents brothers, relatives, and friends. Some of you will be killed. There's no telling who will hate you because of me. Even so, every detail of your body and soul, even the hairs of your head, is in my care. Nothing of you will be lost. Staying with it, that's what is required. Stay with it to the end. You won't be sorry. You'll be saved. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. So this is one of those passages that when I come to the end and say the word of the Lord or the gospel of the Lord and you all respond with, in this case, ho Hosanna, I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> These are not words that seem worthy of praise and thanksgiving and hosannas, right? It makes me want to put a little question mark as I say a praise to you, oh Christ, right? When we come to the end of this, Tell me I'm not alone, that I'm not the only one who reads a passage like this and goes, huh? Yeah? We come to the story this morning and we find Jesus and a bunch of people at the temple. That's where they've been hanging out for a while. That's where we have been as we read through Luke's gospel. And some of them are just marveling at this beautiful building around them. Isn't this great, Jesus? Aren't you impressed? see the workmanship that went into these stones. Look at the memorial gifts that have been given. Isn't it amazing? And Jesus comes in like a wet blanket, just dampening all of that enthusiasm. All this you're admiring so much, she says. The time is coming when every stone in this building will end up in a heap of rubble. What a shock. Can you imagine, not just because this building is this massive, huge, strong, solid structure that would have seemed really almost impossible to destroy, because of all of the things that the temple represents to them. The temple is, after all, the dwelling place of God. This is where God resides. It is the tangible symbol of where God is to be found. This is where people come to encounter the living God in praise and in worship, in story and in song. So to suggest that one day it wouldn't exist anymore is an affront to their beliefs. If the temple is gone, 
then where will they meet God? How can they know that they have been in the presence of God if the temple is no longer there? Now, we who are sitting here in this building this morning may kind of scoff at that idea, this idea that God can be contained and held in a building. We can understand and believe that God is present everywhere. But still, I wonder how often we find ourselves caught up in this same underlying mindset. Because, you see, we make temples all on our own, out of all sorts of experiences and all sorts of things. Some of us, it may be the church building, but it's not just buildings, right? Our worship styles, our habits, our traditions become temples to us sometimes. There are things that speak to us, ways that we have powerfully felt and seen and experienced God's presence moving in our lives. And when that happens, we have this just natural tendency to want to set those things in stone. We want to make them immovable, unchangeable, so that we can come back to them again and again and again. We can know that in that place, in those things, in those experiences, we will be sure that God will show up, that God is there, that we can find God. So we are just as offended when we hear Jesus speak these words so casually to us this morning. These temples that seem so important to you, they're not going to last forever, Jesus says. And we get bent out of shape hearing that and about all sorts of changes. When a beloved pastor of many years retires and moves on. When the way that we distribute and receive communion changes. When we add more leadership, lay leadership in the form of young accolades and we're still trying to work out the kinks. And you all did a wonderful job this morning. But we're still trying to figure out what that looks like and how to do that and, and who's supposed to do what. When we are planning to get new hymnals. And I'll just be straight with you so you're not surprised when we, somewhere down the line, get the money to buy them and they show up in the pews or in the seats. There are going to be hymns in the hymnal that you have never sung. And the first time you sing them, some of them would be like, oh, that was wonderful. But some of them you're going to say, oh, pastor, who picked that hymn? (laughs) I'm going to be part of that so you can blame it on me. Some of you are going to find out, in addition to having to sing new hymns you've never sung, your old, favorite, most wonderful hymn you ever loved in your whole life, didn't make the cut. The committee didn't put it in this new hymnal. And on top of that, there are ten, count them, ten musical settings of the liturgy. The LBW, the green hymnal in your pew, has three. Two of those made it in. The other eight are new and different. So when you first start learning them, you're going to feel uncomfortable, and it's going to take a while to adjust, and it's, uh, I know. I've been through this new hymnal with another congregation, so I know about that, and I know all of these changes are hard. I have been where you are, too. I know, and sometimes it feels like the sky is indeed falling. Like all of these things that we have built our faith on, those foundations, the things we have relied on so long, that we have counted on to be the ways and the places God shows up, that those are being rocked in earthquake-like proportions. I get it. It is normal and natural. We're human beings, after all, and we will be caught up in lamenting all of those things that change and are different. It is normal and natural. Excuse me, and to be expected that we might argue and squabble and complain and try so hard to keep these temples we built with such loving care, keep them standing. But I have to be honest with you this morning, and some of you are going to push back against this and say, geez, Pastor Becky, you've only been here a month. How dare you? You don't, I, I used to work teenage boys in a group home. They say, you don't know me, but I know church. And I know what God was putting on my heart as I prepared this sermon, and I, I even checked with Pastor Chris and said, I don't know, 
But I still felt like I need to say this to you, that these temples that we construct, these are not the things that Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again for. As important as these things may be, as important as they have been to our faith journeys, as much as we have felt God show up in certain ways through certain traditions, all of those things are not eternal. They're not the only way that we can meet God. And so as things change, know that God will show up in new ways. Let yourself see and experience those things. Because in the grand scheme of things, all of this stuff is just not such a big deal. If you want some perspective, just look at the world around us and what is going on. There are people and places where the rest of these verses that Jesus speaks in Luke are coming true for them. Wars and uprisings, earthquakes and famines the tremendous heart-wrenching destruction in the Philippines, the unimaginable loss of life and property, the desperate need for food and water and all of the necessities for life and trying to get that to the people who need it. Closer to home, the neighbor just perhaps even this morning having to choose between paying the rent or feeding their family or buying diapers for their baby. The former drug addict or convicted criminal who trying so hard to claw their way up into a new life and keeps finding their feet knocked out from under them, keeps finding themselves knocked down. There are people all around us, next door and around the globe, who are in urgent need of good news, who need hope, who need someone to reach out a hand to help lift them up. And if we get caught up in our little church disputes about non-essential things, what does that say about the people, say to those who are looking to the church to see who God is and what God is like and what God has to say about all of this tragedy and hurt in our world? What then is our witness to the world? People of God, we are called to be about bigger and better things. We are to be lights in the darkness. We are to be offering hope to the hopeless. We are to be doing God's work with our hands. And I'm glad, as I stand here this morning, to be able to say that I see lots of that kind of stuff. Donations to the food pantry, this upcoming mission trip to Honduras that we blessed those folks this morning. Donations to the ELCA World Hunger Fund and the malaria campaign. Visitation to the homebound and hospitalized. Meals for the chronically ill and bereaved. Care packages for active military members. Small groups where people give and receive love and support and are able to wrestle with these big questions of life and faith. The Good Samaritan Fund, where people from walks of life with all kinds of problems are given assistance with compassion not judgment. These are just a sample of the things that I have seen and witnessed happening here in just this short month that I have been with you, the people of Ascension. And I know I'm so willing to bet that there are many, many, many more. And this is where I see God's love flowing into your lives and then back out, going to a dark and desperate world. This is the power of the risen Christ who empowers you to steady someone else's shaking ground, to shore up the sky that seems to be falling. This is you together, the body of Christ, being built into a living temple where people can come and know and experience that they have been in the presence of the living and ever-loving God. So I say to you this morning, stay with it. That is what God longs for from us. Stay with it to the end. Let these things be what this place is known for. Let this be our witness to the world. We won't be sorry. <laughs>